Arigato gozaimasu. Uh, that's as far as my Japanese goes, apologies. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a huge honor to speak here. Um, and as Yochiro said, I'm going to try to talk in the space in between interaction design and the city. And as one begins to merge with the other more, dis more directly, actually. Um, so uh, this is actually in the Nezu Museum yesterday in the garden there. So it's a bit of Tokyo that is also worth seeing, as well as all of the commercial that Yuichiro talked at. Um, so first things first, and a, and a kind of an apology or an explanation <laughs> to get it out of the way. Um, I'm not really going to talk in a sort of a technical mode, and I know lots of the papers here are quite technical on purpose, which is fantastic. But I'm going to talk more about the context of technology itself, just to sort of set things off. And after I've finished, then you can carry on talking. <laughs> uh, but I think it, it's incre increasingly important to understand the context of technology and how that uh, interacts with the real world around us, of course. Um, I, am, I do have a technical background. I have a computer science degree and all of those things. And I was an interaction designer for many years, as Yuichiro said, um, at the BBC and other places. But over the last 10, 15 years or so, as my hair has got grayer, I found myself uh, in more kind of strategic positions on projects or with organizations. So I'm going to talk a bit about that work. Um, because uh, my sense is that uh, the things that we make now, the digital things that we make specifically, let's say cell phones in this, in this picture here, do directly impact on the physical environment now and vice versa. So sometimes, as you'll see, it's beginning to create new kinds of urban services, or not just urban, of course, actually rural as well, exurban services, products, infrastructures, and so on. But it also impacts the way that we think about designing this kind of space. If we're designing, this is a, an underground station in, in London, but everybody in the picture, as you can see, is looking at their cell phone. And what does that what does that mean? Uh, what are they doing? Are they are they playing uh, Super Mario Brothers or using Facebook? Or are they trying to find the directions? Are they trying to find when the train goes? Could be any one of these things. But traditionally, the built environment stuff, the stuff in the background there, has had no interaction with this. And it's been done by architects and engineers and urban planners who really don't understand the kind of things that you understand. They don't really understand the language of interaction design and service design and so on. So we're now fusing these things together. And for the purpose of the talk, I'm just going to loosely use these phrases like home screen to describe the things on your cell phone, the things, the applications that you use, and then the city, and understand how these two are merging. So the team I run at Arup, uh, as you Chido said, Arup is a very big um, building engineering architecture consultancy. There are many of those in the world. Arup is about 15,000 people all over the world, 90 different offices and so on. My team's about 10 people <laughs> in London, so stretched incredibly thinly across that. And we sort of do the user experience bit. The other 14,990 um, don't do that so much. They uh, make things stand up, or they make things work, or they deliver things on time, and so on. But the kind of stuff that my team does is beginning to address these kind of questions you can see in orange there. And this funny diagram is actually drawings from all of the projects that we did in the last year or so. So we've worked on all of these different scales. We work on the scale of a, a cell phone. You'll see that in there somewhere. All the way up to airports and all points in between buildings and cities and so on. And that's the context of how digital technology and user experience work is beginning now to be of use in those environments, very early days. Um, but there is a long history to technology in the city. The, the British architect Cedric Price said in 1965, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And he, he was reacting at the time to the technology of those days, let's say in the 1960s, the private car, the automobile, was, if you like, the cell phone of its time. It was the thing that was sweeping across civilization, sweeping across the, much of the Western world anyway and beginning to directly change the way that cities happen. Many of you will live in cities that have been, almost all of you will live in cities that have been directly affected by the automobile. And those decisions were taken very quickly sometimes in that humans seem to like a technology. They jump on it and say, that looks like a, an answer or a solution. And often, if you're an engineer, then you're motivated to find solutions to solve problems, right? And so tech is incredibly appealing as a result. And that's effectively what happened with cities. Cities have always been shaped by technology. As much as urban planners and architects, the 
elevator changed cities. Without the elevator, we couldn't be in a building like this. Tokyo would not look like it does without the elevator. But also the drop ceiling, which in this room is hiding all of the service infrastructure. These are kind of really mundane architectural innovations that have changed the way that buildings work. The, the flush toilet mechanism also massively changed the way that cities work. Um, also the automobile, of course, most obviously. So you had cities like Los Angeles, which had the largest tram system or streetcar system in the world in 1955, 56, and then that was removed in about two or three years because of the automobile being looking like the answer. Same in Sydney, Australia, it was the second largest tram system in the world in 1958, was removed again in about two years um, because the automobile looked like the answer. Now about 40, 50 years later, uh, Sydney is putting back its trams at the cost of $1 billion per line back into exactly the same places, George Street in Sydney, that they used to be in in 1958. So you take those decisions in two years, they can have an impact for 200 years when it hits the built environment. This is completely different to obviously designing an app on a phone when you can take something and come and go and where the refresh rate of consumer technologies every two years or so, the refresh rate of cities is much slower and we have to be very careful as a result. So Cedric was asking, fine cars, they look interesting, sure, but how do we want cities to move around? Let's ask that question. How do we want Tokyo to move? Then we can have a conversation about automobiles. So we have to go that way around. And it's not often done. And traditionally in cities, it's not done at all. Um, they don't tend to understand technology. This is a famous picture of the Swiss architect Le Corbusier, who um, in the early 20th century kind of wrote the playbook, if you like, for a lot of the way that 20th century architecture would happen. And this is his hand floating above a model of uh, Plan Voisin, his plan for Paris, which luckily didn't happen. And much of Paris, uh, in the middle at least, looks the way that you know. Of course, at the edges of Paris, it did happen a bit. And across the Western world, it did happen also. And to be clear, Le Corbusier's schemes were often brilliant and his architecture is often incredible, but often people couldn't achieve the same result at scale. So a lot of the copies of Le Corbusier were a lot worse than the original. And that's the problem here as well. The key thing though, is this idea that you can sit above a city and plan it and direct it in this way without really engaging with what's going on on the ground, the people, the systems, the everyday touch points, if you like the interaction design of the city isn't something that architecture and urban planning does. As this implies, there aren't any people in that picture except the kind of godlike hand of Le Corbusier in this sense. So uh, nonetheless, things are moving. Things are moving very differently in cities now as a result of different kinds of technology. So let's look at the kind of technologies that we might be looking at now and in the near future. So this is um, an autonomous shuttle in Helsinki, Finland. And it's live on the public transport system already. This is an autonomous, self-driving little bus, basically. The important thing, in a way, is that it's a little bus <laughs> and not a, self, not a car. So I'll come back to that one. It's running on the public transport system, which is also important. It's not run by, let's say, Uber or Tesla or Alphabet necessarily. It's run by public transport system. That is meaningful in itself as well. Um, but you see the big numbers there from ETH and MIT, uh, very good technical schools. Um, who talk about if you had a shared autonomous fleet like that, you could reduce 80% of the private car use in a city. Now, that's kind of an extraordinary number. And that's a, that's a high number. That's, let's say that's a stretch goal, if you like. No one really knows the number, obviously. It could be 2%. <laughs> it depends on what you do. And it depends on what you want as much as anything. But theoretically, a shared autonomous fleet could indeed have that kind of outcome. And that numbers run for Singapore, New York, but also Zurich region. So different types of density, different types of city. Um, to be clear, that, you know, that little vehicle you saw there is probably version one of something that by version five might be quite good. Uh, this is Easy Mile, actually. It's a French startup. I mean, it's a perfectly fine vehicle, but it, it's, it's not necessarily the answer right now. But it's live and it's running. It's running in Helsinki, trundling backwards and forwards from the city center to the zoo, taking people. So it's not a prototype in that sense. And the rate of change in that technology because of the R&D involved, as you all know, is you know version five might be here in four years. So that's really extraordinary. Um, UBS, which is a Swiss bank, so hardly a bunch of hippies. <laughs> um, they say that you, know, you could reduce urban car ownership by as much as 70% or so. 
So if you were, if you wanted to be the new head of Nissan, for instance, because there's a position vacant, I believe, um, that's a number you need to take knowledge. You need to take great care with one way or another. But equally, if you're building a road, you want to think twice about building the road now, because again, the lock-in. When you build that road, it's there for 200 years. If these kind of dynamics are moving through mobility, you have to be very, very careful. And I'll come back to how as a result in a moment. Same thing with energy. Um, so this is in Australia. This is a, um, a small project. It's about eight buildings, that uh, each of which is four apartments. They share energy with each other. There's renewable energy on the roof, solar cells effectively, because it's Australia. There's enough sun falling on it to power the whole, most of Asia actually, <laughs> one way or another. Um, and it stores the energy in a battery in the basement. And then it uses the blockchain to shuttle the energy around effectively to manage the transactions about where the energy goes. Of course, using blockchain for that is a little bit unnecessary and probably uses more energy than they're saving. Um, so you could just use a normal digital system to share the energy around, and that's, of course, important to figure that out. But what's also important here is that this is then complex, because with energy, when it's on the roof and in the basement and then shared across, let's say, 40 to 50 people or so, suddenly it becomes a social system as well. It's not just a technical system at that point. It's not just a bunch of electrons moving around. It's also, um, say, if I have some spare kilowatts in the evening and Yuichiro is my neighbor and he wants to watch Champions League football tonight, do I give him my kilowatts? Then probably, yes, he's a nice guy. But <laughs> let's say that we fell out for some reason. He made some pasta last week, which was terrible. And uh, then I think, do I want to give him my kilowatts or not? I mean, this is something that we haven't ever had to think about. There's ways to design that system, of course, but that, that overlay now adds a social dimension to what was previously just technical. When we switch on the energy in this room, I bet actually probably no one really knows where the energy comes from. It probably is, um, I mean, it could be anything in Tokyo. It could be solar cells. It could be a coal-fired plant. It could be a nuclear plant. We've never really had to think about that in recent years, at least, not for the last 60 or 70 years. But now this makes it incredibly local, which makes it then personal again. If you get this wrong, you could create kind of a very complex awkward social system where people aren't sharing energy with each other. You get it right, you get the best case scenario of incredibly low energy use and social fabric being generated. But the key question is, how do we generate social fabric as a side effect of generating electricity, perhaps? Or how do we generate electricity and social fabric at the same time? Unless we have a way of talking about that, it's not going to happen. So that's a team that involves electrical engineers, for sure, and interaction designers, for sure, but probably also sociologists and psychologists. So that's a very different kind of design team. In um, Berlin and Zurich, these cooperative housing projects are incredibly interesting. So these are projects not built by property developers who build most of the buildings commercially, but by communities directly. And incredible results. It's between 20% cheaper because you don't have the property developer profit margin in there. People are involved in the design process, so the architecture is actually more interesting because it's built around real people as opposed to generic people which is what most property is built for, is actually generic people. And I don't know any generic people. I don't know if you do. Um, they're incredibly sustainable because if you involve people in the design of the building they're going to live in, then of course they choose renewable energy. Why would you not? They're going to be paying the bills. Property developer doesn't really pay the bills. Once the building's occupied, the tenant does. So this changes the way that that works. This is co-owned, cooperative, and so on. Of course, there's digital systems used all over that thing and the entire process is managed in that way. But again, the important part is this social layer. How do we design with people on board? That again, is something interaction design has a lot to contribute to. New forms of logistics enabled around new kinds of fabrication. This is um, a prototype, as you can tell by the bad render, but this is an MIT City of Amsterdam project for an autonomous logistics network using the canals. So these things join together and they shuttle parcels around. That's incredibly interesting. Logistics is a complete nightmare in the modern city uh, and in Tokyo as much as anywhere, but certainly in cities where e-commerce has really hit hard, most American and British cities, there's a vast number of white vans on the streets now delivering Amazon parcels to people. Um, these things can move in the middle of the night because they don't need light in the traditional sense. They're quiet, they could be electric, they can join together on demand. They run on very different dynamics. You're beginning to get a sense of this distributed, decentralized, dynamic, on-demand, real-time kind of network with this sort of infrastructure. New kinds of fabrication. This is a 3D printed building in Amsterdam, um, enable different kinds of buildings altogether. 
So this one's this is a resin printer by Deuce Architects. Um, these kind of things could pop up within a week or so, and increasingly within days. So it really changes the way you think about buildings, not these just these big static inert structures, but also smaller buildings on demand for particular needs. And then new kinds of governance as well. So different types of decision-making platforms. This is a project I did in Helsinki. I'll talk a bit about this later. Um, we have different tools for coordinating information and coordinating discussion with people. I mean, this happens all the time now. So how does that change the way that city councils work? So all of these things uh, are becoming a different kind of urbanism. I'm sure you're getting a sense already of that different pattern. Instead of a slow, inert, largely top-down process where it's done by the commercial sector or governments to people in that sense, and the infrastructure can't change and the infrastructure can't react. This is distributed, decentralized, real time, more bottom up in that sense. In a networked urbanism, as I describe it, it could aggregate at scale to the scale of a city. And of course, top down is also relevant and hugely important in many ways around resilience, around governance, around all kinds of things. But this is a different set of tools, and it's the kind of tools you'll be familiar with. You're all, you all understand the dynamics of what happens when computers hit things, basically, and how they change differently. So that is happening now with the city. And yet architecture and urban planning, to put it bluntly, has no clue about that. So this is where we have to help. So some of the work we do is working on large-scale urban master plans. This is one for a Chinese city, um, as you can tell by the red lanterns, if you spot them <laughs> in the picture there. Um, and we're playing those things at a scale. So everything I just showed you kind of played out in that. You see a mixture of top-down and bottom-up things in there. So the top-down being the subway system in the bottom there, the bottom-up being the, uh, the, the few cars on the streets, and you see cargo bikes as well as shuttles in there as well. And then what we do, importantly, is we zoom into elements of that and we show little vignettes of things happening at actually the human scale. And that is different then to the Le Corbusier drawing that I showed you earlier. We're actually then beginning to understand, well, how is that going to work? And just to be really clear, this isn't the smart city I'm talking about. I've been a fervent critic of the smart cities idea for about the last 15 years, arguably 25, uh, depending on how long you count that project. But in a smart city, uh, as Shannon Matten puts it, the data is being aggregated for other reasons. All of the things I just showed you, those kind of distributed decentralized systems, are not driven by the data, they're driven by people, and the idea of public good is an outcome, and the, the data is the thing that makes that happen, for sure. But the smart city does that the other way around. The smart city is, a, in effect, a very traditional city-making play, just with computers in it. But it's not that markedly different and incredibly problematic, which is why it isn't happening much, to be honest. What is happening is, I'd say, the, uh, the scale of the cell phone building up from that. That's when you can see cities changing directly. So the key issues there are not technical. And that's really tough to take if you're a technology person. Uh, the key issues there are how do we make that work? Who owns those things? If we can make the city move around with autonomous shuttles, then again, MIT and ETH have already worked out. That's not a technical problem necessarily. Sure, there are technical issues within it. But the key question is how does that work? Who does that? Who owns that stuff? Where does the value go? How is the social fabric um, calibrated or changed as a result of that? So if, you know, for example, those autonomous buses could change the way the street feels, like I showed you briefly in the, in the Chinese city we just designed, that we could radically change the way the streets feel, even as good as the streets in Tokyo feel, for instance. Imagine the street outside the window with 80% fewer vehicles on it. You could begin to introduce trees all the way through that thing, in water all the way through that thing, bikes, of course, pedestrians, kids playing football conceivably in the street there, or baseball or whatever you play here. <laughs> so that's what's happening. Uh, in Paris, they're pushing heavily on the, the car fee streets thing. In Oslo, they're basically getting of all parking in the city center. In Barcelona, they're unlocking the uh, super blocks, which has been there since about 1860. That's the middle of Barcelona. Those things have been waiting effectively for this moment, if you like, when we could actually get rid of most motorized vehicles and slow them right down to about 10 kilometers an hour inside those blocks there. Once you start doing that, you're walking and cycling more than you're driving, for sure. So in that model, do cars become more like horses, actually? There's something that people do at the weekend for fun, which might be a nice thing. So horses, as you may know, is how we used to get things around in cities, of course, in exactly the same way. People used to drive horses through the middle of this. So you look at pictures of Nihonbashi from, uh, 
400 years ago, there would have been a lot of horses in here. And you see the impact of that. In fact, the curbs on the side of the street in any modern city are there because of horse crap, basically, not to put too fine a point on it. It was to sweep the horses waste up against. That's why we have curbs in the first place. They're not really for pedestrians and cars. They're originally to do with horses. So they, they, they shape the city in a long way, long time, these things. But in that sense, we took horses out because they're surpassed by something else and they're kind of problematic in their own way. If you imagine the amount of horse dung around in a city with that many horses in it. Um, and now horses are something you do for leisure. Could cars be the same thing? The private car, I mean, in the most obvious sense. So which could be a nice thing. You can imagine a nice car sharing network where you go and drive a car in the mountains at the weekend and one week it's a Ferrari 328 and the next it's a 1960s Volkswagen Beetle. That's a nice thing to have. But car then becomes a fun thing. It's not a stunt thing to drive into the middle of cities, clearly. That's a crazy thing to do. You see, I mean, Tokyo has figured that out in many, many places, as are many other cities, but most cities are still defined by the car in that sense. So then how do you design a street? This is from a project we did, just kind of sketching something out. So if you have that fewer vehicles in there, the whole street just becomes public realm in that sense. It's just like an elongated square because the safety is packed into the vehicle. You don't really need to pack it into traffic lights and pedestrian crossings. All of those things are awkward. The traffic light is a traffic engineer's solution to the problem of traffic. And people forget that if you, as soon as you invent the motor car, you invent the traffic jam at the same time. You invent accidents too, but you don't really think about that because you're like, hey, motor car. So it's kind of, it's sort of problematic in that sense. Um, so we have to figure out how to pack the safety into the streets generally, not into the car itself. Then we can unlock a completely different kind of street. And how does that feel? So does it feel like this constant flow of kind of movement of these objects at 15 kilometers an hour? Well, this is how cities used to be. This is Sydney in 1906, for instance. And I'm sorry for the bad quality film, but um, I, you know, HD wasn't around in 1906. Uh, but you see a constant line of trams there. I'll just play that again. Um, you see people really not observing the difference between the sidewalk and the, or the pavements and the street. They're just walking wherever they like. You see awnings providing shelter on the left-hand side. Um, horses didn't used to run into awnings because horses aren't stupid. But um, as soon as cars came along, they started removing the awnings because people would crash into them in cars. It turns out people are terrible drivers, basically. So you could have this kind of constant flow, what Jane Jacobs calls the ballet of the streets. Um, and then does the street become like this? This isn't a project we've done. This is by the Dutch architecture firm MVRDV. Uh, is that a street of the future? I mean, it's hard to imagine, of course. And you, can't, you sort of think, well, that looks like a back garden, not a street. And it, in a way, it is. But how, if you have back garden here and you have current street here, where are we on this line? Where could we move the needle is the question. In, a, in the Netherlands, you would, you would need a bit more uh, wet water coverage than it shows in the picture, for sure. But that's an interesting question. But then how do we make that work? So how do you get around in an autonomous vehicle? We made this quick film for a project we were working on, just showing um, really how, what's behind an autonomous shuttle. So in a normal consultant's report, you might say, we'll have an autonomous shared shuttle service. Next slide. <laughs> and we're sort of, hang on a minute, because we're interaction designers, we're thinking, well, how's that going to work? So I'll play this film again in a minute. but you can see that what we're trying to do is flush out, well, how would it actually work? We made this in the office in a few days, just sort of, you know, this is people in my team. They're incredibly bad actors, forgive them. They're designers, not actors. So um, don't look at the camera, Ollie, don't look at the camera. Oh, he looked at the camera. <laughs> um, but what we're trying to do here is flush out how will Anna, in this case, call an autonomous shuttle? And you see that we're not really bothered about the detail of the interaction, because this could be in five years' time, it could be in eight years' time, it could be two years' time. I don't know. So we made up this Project Soli-like fake thing. On, that's my old watch that she's using, just to trade off time against money, because it doesn't really matter how she does that in this instance. What we're trying to find out is, will she share, for instance? And then in this case, she goes outside, there's an autonomous shuttle drop-off point, but you saw it, see, it was doing something else a minute ago. It just became a bus stop for a minute. So the rest of the time, it's doing local information and wayfinding and weather and things like that. But then it becomes a bus stop. And so the advantage of that is that two people can walk past and say, well, I wasn't going that way for half an hour, but seeing as Anna just made a bus, I might as well hop in. So then we get three people into one vehicle, not three people into three vehicles, which is a huge win for the city. If we can get two vehicles off the street for every one that we put on, that's a huge result. But we're trying to figure these things out. You see the kind of almost like the subtitles in the bottom left there. Will she 
get into a small vehicle with strangers. We know that those of you who take Uber Pool, just out of interest, who takes Uber Pool or shared Lyft? Anybody in the audience? Very hesitant hands going up, maybe five or six people. But around 25 to 50 percent, I mean, it's a huge number, it depends, of all Uber and Lyft journeys in San Francisco are shared, which is extraordinary. Because you're getting into a small vehicle with strangers, and that's different to than getting into something like a bus or a tube with, with strangers. People understand that, but getting into a small vehicle is something else. Not everybody will do that. And we don't know how and who does those kinds of things. We need more research on that. How do we do these glanceable interactions? We don't want to have your cell phone pinging all the time in your pocket saying, there's a bus going, there's a bus going, there's a bus going. That would drive you mad. So you need to make something glanceable, like a bus stop, it turns out. Those things might be, there might be edge-based machine learning going on in that thing. So this is, again, a new thing here. It's not shifting it back to the cloud. It's edge-based processing, like Google TensorFlow things, on demand at the street. How do we convey that to people? How on earth do we explain edge-based machine learning in the bus stop at the street? That's the kind of thing we need to explore. So to be clear, the, the answer with these systems is not the current model. If you see the impact of Uber and Lyft on traffic in Manhattan, this is what it looks like on traffic speed. So at the moment, those systems are not being worked well. And I'm not pointing the finger necessarily at them directly. I'm pointing the finger at city authorities who haven't come up with a better way of handling it as much as Uber and Lyft. Both are complicit in this. But they are massively slowing down and massively congesting cities at the moment. They are not smart systems. They are dumb systems. In London on a Friday night, in the centre of London, there's 19,000 Ubers circling around because they're exempt from the congestion charge. We had a congestion charge, which you have to pay money to drive into the centre of London unless you're in a private hire vehicle, a taxi. And that took out about 23,000 cars out of central London over a 10-year period. Amazing, but Uber's put 19,000 back in within three years. So it's deeply problematic in that sense. It's not answering any questions that cities really need solving. So that's an unthinking application of the tech. And I'd say, you know, this is something where interaction design and service design are found wanting because Uber is fantastic interaction design. You know, I mean, you can't uh, argue with it. It's a very good thing. There's 500 designers in San Francisco as an interaction designer. I look at it, it's like, that's a good piece of work. But it's terrible urban design. <laughs> When you scale that to the city, it's, it's awful. It's a system for incentivizing drivers onto the streets, the exact opposite of what we need in most cities. So how do we balance this? And that's where, again, we can't look at it just from the lens of the di digital design disciplines. Because once you scale that to the city, there's something missing. And that's where you see the impact of Uber and others. You start seeing interesting statements around those. So this is the deputy mayor of Paris. The red bit is the key bit there, just to save your eyes. And he said last summer, we should announce before 2020 that in Paris, no privately owned autonomous vehicle will be allowed. Only be mobility as a service. That's a shared autonomous vehicle, the kind of thing I showed you, like the Helsinki thing. That's an incredible statement. So if you're now making an autonomous vehicle, you start thinking, well, I can't sell that in Paris in 2020. I need to be making a bus, a small vehicle or a shared vehicle of some kind, which is interesting, or some kind of taxi, sure. But I'm not going to be making the same volume of private vehicles that we're trying to sell to each of you. Just out of interest, who owns a car in the audience? Again, it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying it's just a thing. So, you know, roughly half at least. So in the future, this is going to be under a different condition, put it that way. In the middle of cities and the edges of cities, you can already see people are trying to squeeze the car out because its impact on cities is basically appalling. So it has to shift in that way. So this is very interesting that deputy mayor says this, but of course deputy mayors say things all the time. Although no other deputy mayor has said anything as interesting as this, I think, for the last two years or so about these things. Um, but a key question is, well, how is that going to work? Jean-Louis, Jean-Louis Miska, how is that going to work? And this is where designers can help. We can help convey how that could work in a city like Paris, because it's going to be, it's not easy. It's not easy technically to make that work. So we need to do that work to make this statement more plausible. It's a fantastic statement. We need to help, because without that, we have this condition we had before, which is that one. So what we do in the team and what others are beginning to do now is we do the missing bits of design before the project, basically. We do the research, we do the concept design, we do the prototypes, the kind of work that you will do, but we're doing it with cities, we're doing it with property developers, we're doing it on the ground. I'll show you some of those examples. And as a result, we need to come up with a set of design principles for introducing technology into these cities. So I'm going to run through a few of those now. 
The first one is dealing with adaptation because we do not know how that technology is going to change and react. It's not like making a subway or a freeway in 1950. If you make a subway now, it's a 200 year bet at least. You make those things to last for a long time and that's their value. But that autonomous vehicle, I mean, who knows? <laughs> I'm theoretically an expert. I wouldn't predict the number that it could reduce in, in cars in a city. I don't know. So we have to deal with adaptation. We have to be able to flex and iterate and pivot and prototype the kind of language you're used to, to from technology. So in Melbourne, we worked on a project on these streets here. Now, this is a big street in Melbourne. You can't really see in this picture, but it's about four or five lanes. It's so big, there's even room for parking down the middle of the street, as well as at the edges of the street. I've got no idea why they built it like that in Melbourne. It's not like they need to land an aircraft on it, but they could more or less land an aircraft on it. So as a result, a lot of the streets are like this. This is a really wide street. As you see, it's right next to the central business district. There's not a person in that street, it's just car parking, basically, and that's incredibly valuable land, which seems a real waste to have hot metal just sitting in the sun all day, getting hotter and hotter. As you know, private cars are basically static 95% of the time. It's kind of an extraordinarily wasteful system. 95% of the time, a car is just sitting there like this. We can't afford to do that for a number of reasons, particularly in cities in like Melbourne where affordable housing is a problem and it needs to grow and it's growing rapidly. It's not, theoretically has no space. There's tons of space in this picture. But how we change this, so this is a strategic project, which is a speculative thing that we've done just to describe a way of dealing with it. So the first thing we do is start gathering data about that. So we put in public Wi-Fi, we can use other things like the kind of services I talked about previously. Um, we make that stuff legible, so you explain what's going on. That's important. I'll come back to that. Just to gather data about what's actually happening here. Where are the patterns of use in the street here? Then we double up the parking on the left-hand side just by angling it. So then we can move the cars from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, so we can sneak in a bike lane there. And because it's illegal to cycle without a helmet in Melbourne, we deliberately draw people without helmets just to annoy people. Um, but to have the conversation about hang on, shouldn't we be getting to a condition where we can cycle without having to wear a helmet? That would be a nice place to be. And the cyclists are not drawn with Lycra and like racing bikes as they usually are in Melbourne, but like they are in Tokyo, just a normal bike for getting around. So then this thing here, well, let's, let's test the autonomous shuttle, the one I showed you before, the Easy Mile thing, the French startup that's live in Helsinki. Let's test that now because we don't know if it's going to work. So we have to prototype. So let's just trial one moving backwards and forwards to the city. So then this becomes that rideshare pickup point. So we're now consolidating a bit here on the left hand side. Pickup point, we've got some bench, we've got some bike sharing and so on. Then we can begin to borrow some planting from the middle bit all around. We can begin to densify and green up this place a bit until finally we can make the big move here, which is shared surface. You can still drive down the left-hand side in this picture should you need to, but you have all of this other stuff going on the right. And then you can begin to see now the value of the street. This street's completely changed in what, five or six different steps. Now we could do that theoretically again tomorrow. It's easy for us to draw the picture and imagine the street changing. That's not the hard bit. Um, what's harder is describing the value there. So let's think about the value. So there's kids playing football, which is nice. So that's super good, but what else? So the air is cleaner. Um, it's more biodiverse. Uh, the, it's doing natural stormwater retention. So when the rainfall happens, it's being soaked up by the greenery. The greenery is doing multiple things. It's capturing carbon and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's far more active. There's more businesses likely to be happening there. The property value has gone up if you want the property value to go up. The safety is improved, as in there's fewer accidents and things like that. People are healthier because they're walking more and so on. You have multiple, multiple positive outcomes from this. But you still can't just shift it from that to that. If I change that now in Melbourne and to this, then people will kill me because they think it's their, effectively their human right to park a car there. It's not, of course, but that's what we've let happen. So the way that we do that is a very different kind of strategy. It's not urban planning as traditionally. Urban planning traditionally, you hand in this drawing to the city council and they give you a thumbs up and you say, let's all cross our fingers and pretend that's going to happen by 2030. Never happens, but that's what it is like. But actually what we want to do is pivot as we're going along. So we, as you saw, we started with some very simple things here and actually the cheap stuff as well. You can start putting that into the street tomorrow. The more expensive stuff, the flexible program, the shared surface, that's towards the end. But by that point, you can pay for it because of all the value I just described earlier has been unlocked at that point. But importantly, you can pivot halfway through. So number three, the autonomous vehicle, if it's not ready yet, then let's just try an e-bike sharing network or something else instead. You can take advantage of it. 
at the right time. If it's not the autonomous vehicle, then fine, we do something else. But it enables you to shift backwards and forwards, as you would do with any technology-led prototyping project. But the city doesn't traditionally work like that. So this is a big change. And it's because this technology is different. It's contingent. We don't know how it's going to work. Sometimes it breaks. It's what David Weinberger would call small pieces loosely joined in the early or the late 90s, he wrote a book about the way the internet works, which was a big influence on me and many designers at the time. That's kind of the way we're thinking about cities now as well. It's participative. You can take people with you as you're going along through the process, which is hugely important. You don't do this to people, you do it with people. And it's complex, but it's, we're comfortable with it. We're not pretending it's a simple answer. We have a design process that enables the complexity to unfold over time. So another principle now, quiet technology. This is something we looked at um, a couple of years ago with um, bikes and interaction design in mind. We started looking at what would be a better way of doing wayfinding for cyclists. Could you have a helmet with effectively Google Glass in it? We were talking to, with Google Glass at the time and Transport for London. And what we're really trying to understand here, if I run that again, is how do cyclists actually navigate? They don't move like a car with TomTom -tom or Google Maps in a car where it's left and then right and then left and then right. They actually move through spaces like that tunnel there. So could she see that set of direction, have the flexibility that a mobile phone, a cell phone gives you with Google Maps, but actually have it in a head-up display on a bike? Now, that isn't the answer because that would be a very expensive bike helmet, as you know. Also, it's quite hard to lock things onto bits of city, even with all of the machine vision technology we have to hand. Theoretically, I'm sure someone in the room can figure that out. That should be nice. By the end of the day, it would be great. But it's an, still an expensive bike helmet, maybe too expensive for a bike helmet. So then we took it to another next step and thought, well, what's the thing that the tech can do that only the tech can do? But we went against cyclists paying attention to the street. So the tech could look through the houses here and just say, well, you're going down there. You'll see a very tall building, the shard, and then you turn right. So we, there we're getting the tech to do the one thing the tech can do, which is look through buildings, x-ray the city, if you like. But she's still able to be heads up and paying attention to the road. We don't want her looking down at her cell phone, particularly in London. She will die if she's cycling like that. So we have to do that. And now what's nice about that is we're teaching her to read the city. This is why we call this a quiet tech principle. And once she's done that route a couple of times, she can take the visor off. She doesn't need it anymore. She's learned to read the city, which is a much better way to go. So the technology actually disappears. Now, most product companies don't want you to have the technology disappear at some point. From our point of view, it's a fantastic result. If she can just navigate the city instinctively almost, best scenario. So the technology is quiet in that sense. And then another one we just said, well, imagine uh, this is important in London because there's terrible air quality. This just says the clean air is to the left right now. So in real time, it's a real time sensor on the handlebars. It's a very simple thing, super simple display, as in you could do it with colored e-ink or something. And it's just saying head to the left-ish and there's clean air. So we get that from the sensor that could be located in the thing on the left there, and it communicates to the cell phone in his pocket, which pings the thing to the handlebar. So we're understanding a system at play here. We're making the display the dumbest bit of the system, the lightest, most low res, if you like. Again, it could be e-ink on a very simple display. The battery life would last for a long time, and it could be quite resilient and robust in that sense, knowing that he's got the smartphone in the pocket, which is the computer, and it's talking to the network, which is in the street. So we're beginning to thread the system together in that way, but we're also understanding well, the tech needs to be super quiet again. It needs to just sort of do the minimal thing. We used to sometimes call this minimum viable magic. It's like, what's the, what's the tiniest thing that the tech could do? Not the most that the tech could do, but the least. So this is a kind of a question about keeping technology humble, or well, a third principle. And we know that one of the issues here with cell phones is that they are not humble. They are grabbing people's attention all the time notifications, social media, filter bubbles, sexting, anything, <laughs> Trump, Brexit, all of these things in some way to do with the cell phone. <laughs> um, obviously to do with other things as well, but the social media is complicit within that, the cell phone is complicit within that. And when I was at Daikanyama last night and I saw this, you know, in any, any city in the world you see this, but we're seeing this complete bubble around ourselves now in what were previously social spaces. So it's really problematic. So one of the things that we're looking at, and lots of other people are looking at, is how do you keep notifications down to the smallest possible trigger in a system like this? Knowing that, again, you want people to be heads up in the city, talking to each other, looking around, paying attention for numerous good reasons. 
So one thing we worked on last year was actually <laughs> the opposite of a smartphone, which was this, the punked MP02, which is a cell phone as they used to be, if you like, or if you like, just a phone. It just does texts and calls and that's it. And it has real buttons, physical buttons that you use, no touchscreen, sorry, touchscreen enthusiasts. <laughs> but there's a value to buttons as well. And this is what the project was about. What is the value of buttons? I can send a text. Anybody that's old enough in the audience could probably also used to do this in 1998, 99. You could send a text from your pocket without taking the phone out of your pocket with buttons because you kind of knew where the numbers were. You could certainly say, hello, hi, how are you? Things like that. So there's a value to that. The value also is that it's quiet and humble. It doesn't do anything. It's really unbelievable. It's trying to use this in a city now is incredibly hard, I tell you. When the first time you go out into a city with just this phone, you feel like you've had your right arm chopped off or something. There's no maps, there's nothing. It's kind of extraordinary how much we've become reliant on the other thing, the smartphone, straight away. So with this project, here was the concept design for something we called phoneness. What's the essence of the phone within that? And we went through all of the different things that a phone could do just enough and still be a phone and not be a smartphone, not be a computer in that sense. So again, we're looking at different keypad layouts, buttons, all the kinds of things you could do it. How could you even do a basic form of mapping should you wish to? This isn't in the phone that's coming out now, by the way, but it's, uh, it's capable of being introduced later, which would just be you're heading over there. That's it. So it's like, I call this like the world's lamest augmented reality. <laughs> you hold your phone over the city and it's just got an arrow. It's going that way. And then you put it back in your pocket. You could do that with GPS and mapping, but you don't have to show the map and you don't have to show all of the detail there. It's just an arrow. So these are the kinds of interactions on the um, device that's coming out now. It's super simple on purpose. And I know it's really perverse to show it to you when you've just, you're doing extraordinary things with uh, responsive touch-based screens and no doubt flexible displays and all kinds of stuff. This is going back on purpose. So it's a niche product for sure. It's going up against the most successful product of all time, the smartphone, but it's interesting as a result. And then what happens in a city when you start playing those principles out? We worked on this project in Melbourne and we did a bit of user research. This is our usual method. I'll skip that stuff there. And we started understanding, well, how could a building like a studio building or a university building work using these principles? So just back there, I'll just go back again. We're using e-ink a lot in these situations because that e-ink there, which is showing today studio low, that can be the real time bit up applied to a physical sign. The open bit there is e-ink, the rest of it is physical. The physical bit doesn't change the name of the building. The opening closing, that can be real time. The corridors in this building are super interesting, but we wanted to make them social spaces. So how do you have these very simple displays on purpose? that are really quick triggers, just showing what's going on now. This is fed by Slack, which we realized that everybody in the building was using Slack as their messaging system. There's an API out of that. You can then shout to the building out of Slack. Um, you can run these kinds of things like this. Let's say Becca's in her studio there, but I'm in a studio half a kilometer of the other direction. How do I know she's in or out? Well, a simple $5 door sensor that updates her Slack status automatically. She doesn't have to go into Slack to open up her phone, to open up her tablet or a laptop. The door itself is the interface. And we've used doors as interfaces for thousands of years. You know, if you leave the door ajar, it means you can come in. If it's closed, it probably isn't. This one is then shouting to the building and so on. And of course, because it's Melbourne, everything ends in drinks at the end of the day. But um, you see this kind of very, very light touch on purpose. Same thing the, with the Royal Parks in London. Here we're saying, how can the parks lasso a bit of park and send a message out to a park? Well, what you can't do is have a huge 40 inch LED screen in the middle of Hyde Park. The queen will kill you basically if you attach one of those to a tree. But you could have something like this, which again is an e-ink display and a sandwich board. So this is a mock-up, as you can imagine, because e-ink displays are still not quite affordable at that sort of size, but they're not that far off now. Because all this has to do is that. It doesn't have to do HD. It doesn't have to show Mad Max, you know, in 30 frames a second and 19, 20 pixels wide or anything. It just has to do that. And that sits humbly in its environment in the park. You can kind of imagine that happening in that sense, in that environment. This, if this sign does this, uh, it's better than not doing that. But again, it doesn't have to do anything else at all. So we're trying to make the tech as simple as possible because in the context of the park, that would be the right thing to do. We don't need to deploy anything else. Super low battery usage, all of those things. Very simple RFID tag based thing here. This is a little simple sensor in a badge basically. So she can go up to a sign like this, trigger it. 
and then it becomes a curated walkthrough. The advantage of doing that here rather than on her phone is it has what we call a social halo around it. Other people can walk past and say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Where do you get that little token? You get that in that thing. Oh, where does that go? I'll come with you. That kind of interaction that you have around physical maps now, but it's got digital characteristics in that sense. You do that on the phone, you don't see that. The phone is a very individualizing interface. That's its huge benefit. It's just for you. But cities are not just for you. Cities are actually for everyone. That's the balance we've got to get right. So making things legible, hugely important. How do you understand these systems? How do you understand what's going on? As we know, you drop sensors into the street, as I did on those previous projects, you're going to have a massive problem unless you tell people what's going on, as we've seen in numerous projects all over the world. Uh, Chicago and others where they've led sensor-based technologies from computer science departments have been held back for years and years because they haven't conveyed it to the public what's going on in the right way. So one project I take as inspiration here isn't really a project even, it's just an example. This is the first telephone box in the Netherlands, the very first one. And it's in a museum of telephone boxes in the Netherlands, which is the kind of thing they have in the Netherlands. Um, and it's beautiful, of course, it's amazing tiled thing here and it's beautiful glass and the typography is phenomenal as you'd expect with the Dutch. But the interesting thing there is that little stained glass thing, the bird on the wire there, what that is saying is that it's explaining the way that telephones work. It's saying that you can sit in this box in Amsterdam and call someone in Rotterdam, but just be aware there's an operator on the line listening. That's it. And that's what the little bird is doing. It says there's a line physically between here and Rotterdam, but there'll be an operator listening, so be careful what you say if you like, unless you want the operator to hear it. So it's incredibly subtle. I mean, it's too subtle, really, for uh, British people like me. You can get away with that in the Netherlands because they're sophisticated. But we probably need to explain much more detail how things work. So this product, this thing, this new telephone box, kind of implicitly described the seams of the system in its physical design, which is amazing. Sometimes we talk about seamless, making things seamless. I'd argue in these kinds of places, we need to make them seem full. We need to make beautiful seams, as Matthew Weiner, I think, said, but we need to make them seem full to explain how systems are working. Again, imagine this with machine learning on edge-based networks. We need to explain how those things work, otherwise they're just not going to happen, even if technically they're possible. And if you look at how we do things in cities at the moment in terms of explaining what's going on, it's appalling. This is a film I made in London just because I had to stop looking at these things, but basically these pieces of paper are planning notices. So this is something saying that there is a building about to be built in your neighborhood or there is, you know, a football pitch is about to be turned into a car park or a door is going to be turned into this or it could be a car park is going to be turned into a football pitch, whatever. But the, the way that we do this is so appalling. <laughs> we basically, we tie a piece of paper to a lamppost in the rain and we hope you might look at it. <laughs> That's in London, a 21st century city of a theoretically untold wealth with all of the tech there. And what we do is we tie a piece of paper to a lamppost and that's our best attempt at engaging people with what's going on in their city. And even if you look at the language here, it's kind of, how does this affect you in 36 bold Helvetica? How does what affect me? Something's gonna affect me? You're immediately in a negative conversation. And people know this, of course, it's why most people just completely ignore it. And the only people that respond are people that really want to complain and have time to complain, basically, the kind of people that go to neighborhood meetings. So it's the worst possible outcome for conveying something as fundamental as this is your street and there could be a 10 story block of flats being built at the end of it. What do you think? You know, it's really important. So we don't do that well at all. I mean, it's the same in most cities. Um, so we did a small project with Ericsson just looking at um, how this could happen a bit differently. And this is just using augmented reality. So it's not saying this is the answer, and this is a mock-up as you can see, but we said, imagine there's a 5G transceiver on the wall there, and then that you're able to basically have, because of edge cache-based networks, 3D model of the proposed development dropped to your phone in situ. So you can say, this is gonna be a bicycle rack, or this is gonna be a community garden, this is a community garden that someone's modified with a bicycle rack. And on the left hand side, it says, this is what the value of the project would be. And it's not a simple kind of thumbs up, thumbs down, because this is too complex for a simple thumbs up, thumbs down. Those simple referendums is what leads to Brexit again, which is not a good thing. Uh, this is more complex than that, because if you make that the bike rack, it can't be the cafe. If you make it a cafe, it can't really be the bike rack or the community garden. These are they're mutually exclusive. So it's very different to most digital systems. Hello, squirrel. <laughs> 
So this, this was kind of, um, actually from Ericsson's point of view, Ericsson R&D, who we work with on this, this is conveying what would be the value of 5G, as in 5G can cache a th point cloud model from a LiDAR scan of the urban environment, have a 3D model cached at the edge of the street, send it to your device and be able to locate you precisely. It can do all of those sort of things. Another thing that we were looking at was then, well, how do you bring this into then the meetings? So this would be um, the, these models you often have in meetings with people, uh, designers or stakeholders of the community, but could use the AR layer just to say, this is the data about solar gain, the amount of sun falling on that building this way around, whereas if you turn it like that, it's half, or it's you know a third or whatever. So this is the kind of insight you need in the meeting, because usually when we do these meetings with these models, which everybody loves, everybody loves physical models because we grew up with them from the age of one, um, but then at the end of the meeting, we usually have to go away and say, okay, we're gonna do some maths, I'll see you in two weeks. It slows the whole things down. We have the whole thing in digital models now, so we could begin to drop them in in real time. Then you can have the conversation and say, okay, that way around we get solar cells, the other way around we grow tomatoes, that's fine. But you have the decision in real time again, which is really fundamentally different. So with Ericsson, then they then went to Johannesburg, Witts University, and they built something completely different actually. They did a LiDAR scan of the neighborhood around this area. And then from the LiDAR scan, they actually made um, a Minecraft model. They worked with Mojang, the Minecraft developers, to make a Minecraft model of the whole neighborhood via a bit of Street View <laughs> mapping. Uh, where's Minecraft? There it is. And then they worked with students to then modify this, because Minecraft is actually really easy to use for almost everybody. So. Uh, and particularly at this level, I mean, kids grow up using Minecraft as their kind of Lego. And then they, we used, they used um, Google Tango, actually, just a Google Tango prototype, and went outside and then took away the original Minecraft model and just left the modifications in. So this shows the modifications developed by the kids, by the students, overlaid onto the urban environment. And you can see this was like straight out of the box, and, but even then it's doing occlusion and things quite well. It's really rough and ready, as you can see. And we're not saying you should build any of these things, by the way, <laughs> but the more importantly, this helps you understand the city is malleable. If you put it in the right platform, you can change the city. You can make modifications to things. You can be part of that process, at least. That's what's being stimulated here. So it's kind of fascinating. And when you, you, you might be able to hear the reactions. This, uh, this is quite different to the piece of paper, <laughs> is my point. It's a very, very simple, rudimentary thing, but how interesting would it be to have this kind of lens onto the city in this way? The ability, as we used to say with websites, to view source, effectively, on the city. You could also do this with pen and paper, by the way. This is a project we did earlier in the year, which was just redrawing the things by hand. We used a 3D model to begin with, but then traced it by hand and dropped those into the middle of Sheffield, who the city in the UK that was doing its planning, massively different uptake in terms of people being engaged by the hand drawing. So hand drawing is incredibly appealing to people. This guy that, who was about 120 years old, as far as I could tell, was pointing to the bit at the top left there saying, that's where my grandfather used to keep cows in the city. You know, he would never have got that conversation if he looked at the traditional diagrams. And Minecraft probably wouldn't have helped him, perhaps, I don't know. So then there's local tech. So this, this is also, this isn't like one system you roll across the world. This one is a, an autonomous shuttle for the north of Finland. And it's designed actually with Muji doing the interiors, which is interesting. But that makes specific sense there. When it gets to minus 25 degrees centigrade, you need a local solution. That isn't gonna be something you just roll across like a Tesla Model 3 or something. What I love about Tokyo is all the vehicles are kind of three quarter size, which is a lovely thing. You know, whereas in America, they're like three times the size, but <laughs> here they're three quarter size, which is just makes perfect sense in a compact city. Everything should be smaller in that sense. Um, we did a project with uh, Punkt again, looking at e-bike for a few different design schools in three different cities. And in Lausanne, they decided to make this little e-bike infrastructure that sits on the front wheel and just spins it round a bit faster because there's hills in Lausanne in Switzerland, so this helps it go up the hill. In London with the Royal College of Art, they made an e-bike that was skinny and tough because London streets are basically terrible. So, and there's not much room, so it was kind of designed in this way. And in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, they noticed that Dutch people often try and fit two people on the bike at the same time. So they just made an extra long seat 
for two people to sit more comfortably. And then when the kickstand goes down, it becomes a bit of public furniture, effectively like a bench. So these are very specific situations. Very specific cities have different cultures. Uh, when uh, Johnny Culkin, an industrial designer in London, designed autonomous vehicles, he made them for Transport for London. This was a huge, this is again a render, but incredibly important that it's Transport for London. This is how people tend to think that's how we move around London. This isn't Uber or Tesla. Again, the, the meaningful thing is who owns it. I'm not saying it's right or wrong that it's TFL or Uber. I mean, personally, I think TFL makes more sense for London. But the key question is that ownership one. So finally here, let's look at this kind of local and civic thing. So one of the best public bike sharing networks in the world, I think, is Oslo. I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of work technically. There's lots of fantastic tech going on in the background. They use a lot of machine learning analytics, um, basically predictive <laughs> analytics, to understand where the bikes need to go. The hardware design is impeccable, and the software is in the right place as well. But just as fundamentally, it's described as the city's bike, and it kind of belongs to the city. So it's the public bike sharing network. It's run by a private company contracted to the city, but the city is the most important thing there in the relationship. The private company just runs them in that sense. So their, their identity is then this kind of city bike identity, and it's very playful and cute and very Oslo, as you'd imagine. Um, but in London, for instance, our bike sharing network is called Santander Bikes, and Santander is a Spanish bank, which is a very different relationship straight away. Previous, it was then Barclays Bikes, which is a British bank, theoretically. But immediately you're thinking, who, so who, who owns the bikes? Is it London or is it the bank? Which one, how do I feel about that? Whereas in Oslo, when it's clearly the city's bike, they then run campaigns with the people that say, these are your bikes, let's all look after them together. Their maintenance rates are lower than in London because people look after them more because it belongs to them. It belongs to the city. Super simple. In terms of adaptive design, they know that you're going to change your phone every two years, probably, roughly, and the software runs on the phone. So they just use elastic bands, rubber bands, to fix the phone to the bike, which is just brilliant because they don't make a bespoke iPhone 10 phone holder knowing that iPhone 11 will be around in two years' time. So this enables it to flex and change in that way. The hardware, though, is slower. They put stuff in the dock instead. They share the data with the city, all the open data with the city, just by default. They have people's names on the bikes. So the most common names in Norway are printed on the bike. So sometimes people ride a bike with their name on it and take a picture to Instagram. Again, it kind of builds this sort of relationship with the city. These are very small, mundane details, but all of them add up to actually benefits to the operator and the city and the individual. And then for full Nordic brownie points, they use recently released prisoners as their maintenance crew. <laughs> So while these prisoners are in prison, they're trained to fix bikes. When they come back into society, they are the maintenance crew. They have a job straight away to go to. They're immediately useful in the city. Solves a problem for the operator because they need a maintenance crew. Solves a problem for the city. Again, it's just holistic thinking in that sense. Um, with this one in Trondheim, ignore that guy's moustache, amazing as it is. Um, they're using a floating bike system as well. So they have fixed bike sharing that you can switch off briefly the sharing when you drop it outside a cafe and it's kind of geofenced. And then when you t leave the cafe again, you turn it on, someone else can pick it up in the meantime. So they have the benefit of say Mobike or Ofo, those bike floating bike networks without the huge waste of those networks, which are incredibly wasteful as you can see. So you get this kind of balance, individual operator city. So again, remember my diagram of interaction design with question mark on the other end. This is how Oslo's figuring it out. Civic outcomes for the city is the key bit there. Usually the first two, almost any tech firm can do. But the third one is also hard to pull off, but um, urban sharing who do that in Oslo have shown how to do that. So those are the design principles for home screen and city that we've been working with on projects. You see a lot of our projects are prototypes in this very early stage to test the thinking, to open up the possibilities in the right way, to get these ideas of the city, the individual, the operator, all on board. So finally, I'll close just by talking about this kind of practice. What I actually call this is, is strategic design. I think that's the missing bit there. It's using design in the context of decision making, design in the context of, in this case, city making, design in the context of large systems, systemic outcomes, things like that. And that's important because traditionally, you don't address that as a designer. This is from Victor Papanak's famous book in the 70s, where he says, usually as a designer, we're attacking a very, very small piece of the real problem. We need to get into the rest of that triangle when we're dealing with things as complex as urbanization, climate change, all of the issues we're facing now. And it's incredibly important because 
cities and governments are not in the right shape at the moment. The systems by which we've set up around decision making, whether it's in Japan or the UK, are 19th century, perhaps 20th century, sometimes 18th century in origin, and they've been updated a few times, but still, they come from a different age. Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State for the United States, said we have 21st century challenges, climate change, most obviously, but others as well, urbanization, migration, obesity, take your pick. Um, we're evaluating them with 20th century ideas and responding with 19th century tools. So we can't do that in the same way. So the kind of work that we're doing with cities is getting deep inside the cities, as deep as we can go, and helping them think differently. So this work in Amsterdam, this is with the city of Amsterdam, we're using all of the technologies I've shown you about and just unlocking it in the minds of urban planners and policymakers so they understand what these things are. This is in Sheffield looking at a new library. We often use these simple cards where we're just describing these are different possibilities. They have different characteristics. This is in Stockholm, exactly the same thing on new urban developments in Stockholm where we're beginning to understand this is how something could change. And we'll make that very tangible on the end. We'll draw a, you know, basically a new chunk of city that comes out of it, which has come from their work. And it's got all of those ideas that I've talked about in there, but it's also recognizable. It's not um, the Jetsons or some you know, incredibly complex city that they don't understand. It's something that looks every day. Of course, it is complex because every day is complex. You go to any market, you go to the street, you go to uh, anywhere, a favela, you go to any community in the city is a complex environment and we simplify them too much. So we're trying to understand how do you have that everyday complexity in this sense. Drawing it is one thing. Then it's how do you build a team to handle that? So this is a project we did with Stockholm off the back of that saying, what would be a city making team in the 21st century? And this is what they came up with after we coached them a bit. <laughs> The ones in white there who's traditionally in a city making team inside the city government, architects, urban planners, maybe someone who liaises property development. But they also started coming up with historian, artist, data scientist, sociologist. You know, you'd want those involved as well. Then you're dealing with the true complexity of the city, but in a very tangible way. This is really important. This is design as well. Designing the team that makes something happen is as important as drawing the picture of the city on the other end of it. Because if you draw the picture on the city, it's not going to happen unless you have a different team running it. So this complexity, um, this is last night, again, near Daikanyama, but cities are complex systems. And we don't want to tame that. We don't want to reduce that. That's what happens, again, when, you, when policymaking goes bad. It ends up being reduced down to very simplistic black or white, this or that. Britain in Europe, Britain not in Europe. Sorry, it's on my mind a lot. <laughs> um, and in reality, imagine how complex that environment is if you try to map it and truly understand what's going on in it. But of course, you walk through that all the time and you understand it implicitly. So every day we deal with complexity because you're a part of it. And Japan is very good at that, by the way, I would say. Um, uh, particularly contemporary Japanese architecture has this beautiful balance of the everyday complexity like Nishizawa's projects where he built this series of blocks that you can inhabit and is kind of merged into the city and the city is part of the house and they're very porous boundaries from one to another um, because there's no real sense of public and private in the same way in a Japanese city that we would have in a other Western city. Or Su Fujimoto's incredible house here, which is kind of on show all the time. And again, there's no real sense of public or private in the traditional sense. And of course, there's an incredibly complex series of layers going on there. Uh, traditional shoji like sliding doors things or all of these things are used in that way to calibrate complexity in a way that makes perfect sense to anybody that's lived in a traditional Japanese house. And at the same time is incredibly complex. And Fu Fujimoto talks about, you know, there is no real difference between a house and a city or public and private. It's just the depth. <laughs> so like the middle of your house is the most private bit of the city and the front of the house is the most public, public bit of the house. You know, it's, it's just that makes perfect sense and is yet yeah, very complex. So how do you do this kind of work for an example? And then I'll, I'll close. This is a, um, a project we worked on in Helsinki where we wanted to make a, a wooden building. This, this whole building here is cross laminate timber. It's all wood. This is a render, but the real thing exists now. It's about eight stories of wood, and you can, make a, you can make a building this tall now, pretty much, or at least up to this floor, maybe 12 stories out of wood and completely. No steel required, no concrete. It's cross laminate timber, it's super dense wood, basically machined timber. So it's incredibly carbon positive. It's, it's 
you can use it off-site, so it, build, it builds a lot quicker. It has numerous, numerous benefits. Um, but it turned out we couldn't make the building we wanted, not for any architectural or technical reason, but because the building code said you can't make a wooden building that big in Helsinki because the building code had been written in about 1900. And if you made a big building in 1900, you'd be crazy because it would burn down. You'd waste all of your money and kill lots of people. So they just said no. But no one had updated the code. So in making the building, our lawyers worked with the city to change the building code. The code is what writes the city. You will understand that because you know what code can do as a generative process. But building codes, which describes what things can be made of, the way they look, the rough shape, the volume, all of those characteristics, is another kind of code. It just writes very slowly. That's its huge value. So by changing the code, we didn't just enable this building, but also this is the new library in Helsinki, new public library, again, almost completely timber. This opens in this month, actually, in about two weeks as well as numerous smaller scale ones. This is actually a wooden building with a brick facade for no reason, <laughs> but it's all wood on the inside. So by changing the code to make this one, we may then enable the whole city to change the way that its building works. So that's a strategic design trick. We didn't just make one building and say, great, fantastic, we made a building. We changed the code that writes the city. And that's what we call in this language kind of dark matter. Again, the bit in red is important. And it comes from a, a Dutch architectural historian called Wouter van Stifu. He said, if you really want to change the city, it's not really about architecture in the traditional sense. It's not about how good your building can be. It's about how do you change the building code? Or how do you change planning? Or how do you change the way we were developers? He described that as dark matter, which I then went and wrote a book about, forgive me the small plug, but dark matter describes everything you can't see that makes something happen or not. So the matter is my iPhone, for instance, or iTunes on my iPhone. The dark matter is the contracts with the record labels that enable iTunes to exist in the first place. Without the contracts, iTunes would be terrible. There'd be no music in it at all, or Spotify for that matter. So you can't see that when you're using the phone, it just works. So often as designers, we concentrate on the matter. The dark matter is the enabling conditions. That could be organizational culture, it could be law, it could be policy, it could be contracts. All of those things are now part of our world. They enable one thing, not another. So finally, let's think about how do we change the code that writes the city? Now the design to do that is more complex than I showed you previously. It cannot be like the slide I showed you after the Uber example. So it looks a bit more like this. You have interaction design, service design, strategic design, working at those different scales. Interaction design, the design of touch points, something I think anybody in the room can handle. Service design, the design of orchestration of touch points, how do all those touch points align to produce a service? Again, things that we're all trained to do. Strategic design is then what happens if you add all of those up to systems across a city? How does that work? How do we create the space for that to happen? We can use speculative design as a kind of a time slider on that. So the projects I showed you earlier are using speculative design techniques to say, let's think of an interaction in two years' time or five years' time or 20 years' time. We can just turn that up or down as a slider, if you like. All design is in the future, which is just whether we're talking about next week or in two years or two weeks. And then architecture and planning move across that scale. Architecture is much more around the interaction design service space. Planning is more strategic design. That's fundamentally important because that's when it hits the hard stuff in cities. So the softer stuff is in the middle, the hard stuff's at the top. Strategic design sort of works as a kind of an umbrella or a bracket across the whole lot, organizing those trades. This on here somewhere is a new kind of emerging design practice for dealing with what happens when the home screen hits the city. So finally, I'll finish with this quote from Gautam Ban, who's a writer in India, who talks about, again, the difference between the, how this isn't smart cities. He talks about the failed nature of the Indian smart cities program. And what he calls, which I love this phrase, the infrastructures of everyday dignity. So just which, again, Japan understands implicitly, as you'll see when you walk around. But how do we bring that into the world of tech without it being smart stuff? How do we understand the value of the shared auto over the expressway? of the bazaar over the mall. How do those things work? And how, how are they complex in the right way, in a very instinctively human way? So as the home screen merges with the city, how do we address both of those in different ways? How do we address the interaction service design end of that diagram? And now it's, in the, now it's changing the way that we physically move and live and work with each other. And then equally, how do we change the way we design and build cities to learn everything we can from interaction design, service design, and tech? Thank you very much. I'll leave it there.
So um, thank you very much. And I think we have some time for questions. So are the mics working, actually? Like, I know, I'm not really familiar with how the system works, but. Your mic it, is working. Oh, yeah, mic, <laughs> mic. No, it's not. OK, yeah, I'll just, uh, if you can line up. One, two, three. Oh, OK, it's working. I don't know if that Japanese is right. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> Apologies if it isn't. Hello, it's working? Okay. Yeah. Hello, so I'm Bruno Fruchard from Telecom Biotech in Paris. So first, thanks for the talk. It's very inspiring. It's very nice. And I like the way that you start from the real problem. <laughs> and you really try to see. And the design you showed on the city, it's really interesting because you really, you don't think out of the box really like from the city and you design things that might be useful right now. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I just had a question about more like the first part of the talk when you were talking about shareable housing, for example, the, the fact that we, we are going to share everything, basically. Mm. Not everything, but we want to, to share a lot of things. And I think there's a big trade-off here. Yeah. Because with our culture right now, usually, when you look, for example, at the Black Friday, we want our own things. <laughs> we want our own devices. We want, And it's kind, of, it's kind of individual at some point. We want to, to yeah. have our own, yes, our own devices. Yeah. So how do you think we can, because there is a kind of um, shift that we have to do here, mm -hmm. to think as a group and not think as an individual, mm. if I get what you say and yeah, where we're going. So how do you think we can deal with that now? <laughs> is there something we can do for that? And are we really going to do this? Or is it something that is an ideal and we cannot do this right now? Thank you for the biggest question in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, it's, um, this is, I mean, this is the question. This is the question of the, of the next 60, 70 years or so. Um, so a lot of our work in cities is driven in two things. One is that cities are intrinsically about sharing. I mean, that is what cities are about. At the end of it, you share the pavement, you share the subway. You know, we sort of, they, they work because of that sharing and they stop working when we don't have that sharing in different ways, as I, as I showed a few times. And it's, it's a really complex, problematic issue right now. The second thing about cities is that we need to make them then sustainable. As in, we need to, well, if you, if you believe the UN, which I do actually on this one, then you know, we need to reduce the global warming to 1.5 degrees. We have about between six and 12 years to figure out the answer to your question. Basically, it's that short, and that then will hit the next 70 or 80 years. And you're entirely right, of course. Our, our culture, if you look at it, has been an increasing shift towards individualization, and at the same time, a shift towards urbanization simultaneously. And that cannot continue in the same path. So when I was flying here on Friday or Saturday, um, I was watching CNN in one of the airports and it was talking about all the backlash to Black Friday simultaneously. So it's, while Black, Black Friday was going on and this rampant commercialization was going on, there's simultaneously there's a backlash against rampant commercialization. I don't know who wins that argument. I, m my job is to steer it, I'd, I'd argue all of our jobs if, ethically, is to steer it towards a condition where we can show the value of sharing and living in cities with people that aren't like you, which is really hard, because uh, that is the way that we can basically sustain in the future. There is n not a possibility in the other direction. As my example, even my example of Uber shows, if you have an individual approach to public transport, which is what Uber sort of is at the moment, the city stops working at that sense. It just can't scale, hence subways, you know. So, yeah, I think it, it, this is the, the biggest problem we faced. I, there's no way I can even give an answer to it. I just say that we, our job as designers with a wider ethical framework is to figure out how to make sharing resources, spaces, the most positive, beneficial, deeply human thing that we could do. And there is everything in us as a species to make that happen. We're a social animal. We're not like other animals in that sense. We created cities, which is the greatest gift I think we've ever given to each other. The whole history of human humanity is a shift towards urbanization over 40,000 years. All of those things are going right. Simultaneously, the individualization is happening. 
Um, so that's the nexus of my talk. That's the work that I'm trying to do here. And it's why I wanted to talk to you today to uh, hopefully unlock all of the great thinking that you have to offer in that context, because we all need to be doing this, I think. Sorry, that's not an answer, but that, that's as close as I can get. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dan. Um, I'm Edward with Nui Tech. I really uh, enjoyed your talk, and you. um, it kind of made me think about like urban spaces as kind of uh, like a shared surface, mm -hmm. where sometimes we introduce, like in, in surfaces, we sometimes introduce stuff in the software to encourage people to collaborate or to behave in a particular way. I almost wondered if there are, if you can give some examples of um, stuff that is done in urban planning or some of the, the designs that you have to kind of encourage people to perhaps behave in ways that are different from the ways that they currently uh, interact and to give us some guidelines as to what are the kinds of things that we need to do to get people to potentially change their behavior in a way that's going to be for the collective good. Uh, but they, they don't necessarily see it as that. They may see it as their own personal good, um, yeah. they, but they're getting a collective good out of it. That's a lovely question. Thank you. Now, I hadn't really thought of um, making the explicit link to shared surfaces in literally the way you did, which is really, really fantastic, because a city is a bunch of shared surfaces yes. <laughs> in that sense. So, you know, I'd say, um, you know, th this thing I showed you, there's a lot of shared surface <laughs> in that film, the street the parks, the bikes, the phone, in a way, is the individual element on it. But as soon as you attach the phone to the bike, it then becomes part of a shared system. And then this is something, an example, where you get an individual benefit, clearly, uh, but there's also a collective benefit. Because getting these people onto bikes instead of cars, then the whole city breathes, the whole city works in a way that if all of those people were in cars, it, the city just would not work. So I think, again, your question is fantastic and, and big. I'm, I'm looking at you know, these kinds of projects to understand how do we build these shared surfaces. This one you know, is, is more explicit in terms of using tech. But for us, it was really fundamental that it was done using AR and not VR. Mm -hmm. Augmented reality <laughs> enables this. So imagine if those guys all had HTC Vive's headsets on instead. It would not be the same thing, mm. I'd argue. I mean, not a bad thing if they had vibes on as well. They would all be walking around and they'd all be looking at the Minecraft and so on. But it, to me, it's fundamental that you can crowd around a phone like this and you share it in that way. So that's literally a shared surface yeah. in the city using it in that sense. All of these things, I think, are examples of that. Um, the ones I showed you in this film, in the park, again, we're trying to find where are the ways that we can do this where it's not just relying on the cell phone as the play out, but it's actually building a new type of shared screen in the environment in this case, because other people benefit from that as well. So again, if it's on my phone, then I, of course I can get the curated walk through the city. That's also nice. And I do that all the time. Of course, I use Google Maps and City Mapper like everybody else. But if we drop it into an urban environment like this, then how is it different? And I think there is something different there. There's what we call again in this work, a social halo there's an instant set of interactions, even if it's just looking over your shoulder and saying, oh, your churro is using the screen. You don't do that when I'm, if, he, if he's got his phone like this, now I'm looking over his shoulder at the screen, that's an awkward thing. It's like a, an intrusion of his privacy. By making it here in public, it's a very different type of thing. Thank you so much. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, but I re again, I really love your idea of the explicit link to shared surfaces and seeing the city as a set of things like that, because this is, again, the work that you're doing. And as it begins to drop out into the streets, I think you have a huge amount to offer. Thank you. Oh, hi. Yeah, uh, I'm Sid from uh, UBC. Um, Joy, wonderful talk. Um, so some of the things I was wondering about, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, some of the principles, to me, felt like they were making assumptions um, about what is this, um, you know where we're heading yeah. in terms of things like efficiency. Yeah. So things like bike sharing and, and sharing tends to uh, have an underpinning of efficiency. And when we go down that road, then we start to get higher and higher densities. And so you just start to end up propagating the same problems like you know, when I've been in cities where bicycles are the dominant 
mm. form of transportation, like in Ho Chi Minh City or something, it's extremely difficult to get around. Mm. Um, as a pedestrian, I mean, it's yeah. just a mess in there. Yeah. Um, so I wonder whether there's some underlying assumptions that are being made around density and efficiency that are going to essentially get us back to where the unintended consequences of urbanization for uh, to lead towards more density, which then supports a larger population, then we're going to end up in even worse situations because the number of people is now, you know, the complexity just gotten even bigger. Yeah. So I kind of feel like this is uh, many of these sort of smart solutions, mm. including some of the ones are basing the assumption on the same assumptions. And so it's mm. actually just contributing to the challenges and the mm. complexity rather than providing alternate pathways. Yeah. Again, a good question. I think the, um, there are a set of assumptions in, in urban planning around density being something we have to deal with and something we have to actually deal with positively. Um, because again, it's, it's also difficult to move around Los Angeles as a pedestrian. <laughs> But it's you know it's it's not bikes that are the problem there. It's the it's the car. So we know that we can't make a low density sprawl based urban model work. This is far more problematic in terms of carbon, in terms of social impact. People are generally more depressed in those environments. There's, there's have health issues off the charts, and so we know that the alternative isn't viable. So we have to make density work. Ho Chi Minh isn't necessarily the answer to that. So it's not like you have to then just move in that direction. Um, it could be Copenhagen as much as anywhere else if you want to see how a bicycle-based city can work well. And when you look at any one of the kind of urban metrics around cities that people either want to move towards or work well sustainably or and or will achieve carbon neutral by 2030, all of those things start merging on cities more like Copenhagen than Los Angeles or Ho Chi Minh City. And that's, that's taking cars out of the way. Um, and cars were the sort of ultimate efficiency motivator originally, and replacing it with different modes of transport and then different patterns of living and so on. You're really, I think you're fundamentally correct about efficiency being a problem <laughs> when it's driving the design. And that's an issue then with an engineering culture sometimes you have in cities, we have in cities where it's seen as an efficiency generator and it's why I deliberately said this isn't smart cities because smart cities tends towards efficiency being the answer and people usually don't want to move towards cities because they're efficient they move to cities because they want a job or they want to fall in love or start a band or something you know it's like it's actually those are the things people make cities for and want to live in cities about it's not to be efficient necessarily so it's kind of why I deliberately showed this really funny, awkward phone, because this is really inefficient <laughs> in a way. Um, in terms of, you know, you try using T9, to, I know someone was doing something about T9, I saw it in the papers earlier, but T9 texting is hard compared to what we currently use now on a smartphone. It slows you down, um, but that's one of the charming things about using this phone, actually, is it slows you down and you can't be efficient, and then you realize actually there's more to life. <laughs> that I'd rather be sitting in this cafe talking to my kids than taking a picture of them on Instagram, you know. I should be rather interacting with them. And so the nice thing about this kind of very deliberately inefficient phone was that we found it's actually more pleasurable. You're less stressed using it than if you're using a smartphone. So we take the same principles into cities. It's why, uh, you know, we create all kinds of things in cities that aren't just about efficiency in reality. And the best bits of cities are ones that are sometimes the least efficient. They're the hardest to design, for sure. So I kind of see where your question's coming from, but, it's, but I'd say the answer, the answer can't be low density because we just can't make that stack up. It's just not gonna work. So the answer is, or the question is, how do we create higher density cities where efficiency isn't the driver, but a good city is the driver? That's a good question to wrestle with. The kind of approaches I've been talking about will get you in that direction along with many others. Right, and I guess I, I, I would question some of those assumptions that you were just suggesting. So, mm. you know, for, for example, yeah. if, if there's less people, yeah. if you just make the assumption that this footprint is only going to support this many people, 
then you don't have this design problem of an infinite number of people that you're going to be supporting. Yeah. And many of these principles are based on the idea that we're just going to keep having more and more people versus, say, designing around a city that discourages anything over a certain level that it's going to be able to support comfortably. Yes. So that I will know that there's no room for me. No, that, that I agree with. So I don't agree with the fewer people bit because we, we, that's a really hard. Well, thing. that's a, a much bigger <laughs> question. Yeah, but, the, uh, but I do agree with um, cities at a certain scale. Uh, Portland is a good example. It has an urban growth boundary, which is a technical thing. Again, it's a policy thing, which just says that's the edge of the city and we're not going to go beyond that line effectively. Again, many European cities have that model as well. So you can, you can hold a city at a million people or 600,000 people. That's, that's a good size, but that's at a scale. And when it gets to Ho Chi Minh, it's problematic. Tokyo is interesting because it's 30 million people, but built actually most of it around low density, connected by high-speed subway. So it also works in reality, not as a 30 million people entity, but um, you know, 30 times 1 million, if you like. So 30 Copenhagens, if you think of it that way. So I think, I think in reality, yeah, there's, there's definitely a sense where you can get this right balance between total number of people and the density, and it maybe is between 500,000 and a million people or thereabouts for a city. So, and once it goes beyond that, yes, it's problematic. London is out of control. You know, New York is out of control in that sense. Then they, you can't really plan for them. But um, that's where, again, I, come, I finished with this sense of dark matter. The urban growth boundary is, is as important as any building in Portland, in fact, more important. That's what limits the growth of it to the right amount. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so we're running out of time, so we have to cut off the discussion here. And so we'd like to close the session with another.